It's high time so we start the second section of our conference. First, we shall have speeches, and after speeches, we shall take to discussion questions, answers. Now, the floor will be given to Dr. Igor Boshevailo. I call the Adamis Deputy Head and the Director at the Ukrainian Museum. He will present on the protection of the cultural heritage uh, which uh, were damaged uh, after uh, warfare in Crimea. Please, Mr. Boshevailo, floor is yours. You are cordially welcome. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to participate in the conference and I'm so grateful to the organizers, to the partners and to the participants of the conference uh, for raising the topic of protection of cultural heritage in armed conflicts and under occupation. Uh, it is our common responsibility to safeguard cultural heritage that represents our nation's identities and has long become an integral part of humankind's legacy. Uh, first of all, let me start my talk with the words of Ukraine's Ambassador Volodymyr Yelchenko, who stated at the United Nations Security Council briefing on the protection of cultural heritage in armed conflicts that since times of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Emmer de Vatel, the international community has developed a wide framework of rules and procedures to protect cultural heritage from harm. However, it continues to remain the object of destruction, looting and trafficking. The aftermath of recent and ongoing conflicts in Europe, Eurasia, Central Asia, Middle East and Africa are still fresh in our memory with numerous barbaric acts committed against the civilization itself. Regrettably, the topic of the conference is also so relevant to the situation in my country, as the objects of its cultural heritage are being damaged, destroyed, illicitly looted, excavated, and subsequently trafficked out of Ukraine from its occupied territories. Let me provide some deeper insight into the cultural heritage protection in times of conflict in Ukraine, presenting the three ongoing cases on Euromaidan protests, occupation of Crimea, and military intervention in Donbass. As you may well know, Euromaidan began when former Ukrainian president uh, Yanukovych rejected a treaty with the Euromaidan, uh, European Union in November 2013. The peaceful movement protesting the widespread corruption and restrictions on human rights and freedoms turned into the project of complete renewal of the state and the system of power and has received the name of the revolution of dignity. Strategically, Ukraine turned its back to the communist past and turned its face towards the civilized countries by launching that decolonize uh, processes. In January 2014, a number of cultural institutions, including the National Art Museum, the Kiev City Museum, the Parliamentary Library, archives of the National Academy of Sciences, and the large number of architectural and historical monuments located in the downtown of Ukraine's capital, found themselves at the epicenter of street battles between the right police and the protesters. The cultural heritage as well as people became the hostages of the escalating political standouts. Most cultural properties survived due to DRM strong leadership and capacity displayed by some museum, museums and cultural institutions at, the, at that moment. But some uh, like the city Kyiv museum lost a part of his collections looted by the riot police. It is important to note at, the, at this conference, especially that the Ukrainian Committee of the Blue Shield 
was founded in that so-called winter on fire as a public response to the crisis. The ICBS Ukraine and ICOM Ukraine activists coordinated efforts between museums, libraries, and archives workers, members of public institutions, organizations, and volunteers uh, to prevent vandalism and looting, provocations and damage to cultural heritage in times of mass protests and violence. They managed to stop a chaotic wave of damaging the Soviet time monuments in Kyiv and helped clean up storage rooms and evacuate the Kyiv city museum collections. The cultural activists provided 24 hour monitoring and patrol in the capital's downtown. They initiated activity of an expert group to protect cultural property from looting and vandalism at the official presidential residence Majahiria and transported its artifacts for temporary storage in the National Art Museum. Later, this exhibition was displayed uh, at, the, at this museum. Blue Shield Ukraine was also communicating with its international colleagues, providing them information on the events and getting advice, expertise, and support. In January 2014, a few museums and NGOs launched a joint project, the Maidan Museum Initiative, in order to preserve artifacts displaying in a different ways the unprecedented movement for freedom and dignity. Now it is a state-run institution I'm working in, entitled officially the National Memorial Complex to the Hamley Hundred Heroes and the Revolution of Dignity Museum. It addresses challenges and possibilities in presenting conflicted history, healing trauma, cultural heritage protection in times of crisis, provides post-conflict dialogue and strives to promote national reconciliation. Let me turn to the next case study, Crimea. After the revolution of dignity, Ukraine lost its territorial integrity as Russian Federation occupied Crimea and was engaged in occupation of Ukraine's Eastern regions, which were declared by the separatist quasi governments as independent republics in spring of 2014. Over 13,000 people were killed in this non-declared hybrid war and over 1 million and a half people internally displayed from the occupied Donbass and Crimea. Ukraine lost all its cultural property on the peninsula, including the ancient city of Tauric Kherson as nicknamed the Ukrainian Pompeii, founded in the fifth century BC and its horror in Sevastopol, which was inscribed to the UNESCO World Heritage List in 2013, just before Euromaidan. This large classical archeology span site on the Black Sea suffers presently from structural damage due to surrounding modern development. As of January 1st, 2014, on the Crimean Peninsula, there were 14,000 cultural monuments, 54 museums, 300,000 museum objects, six historical and cultural reserves. In a short period of time, by the end of 2014, a regulatory framework was issued by uh, Russian Federation, which made it possible to integrate the Crimean cultural heritage into Russia's, Russia's legal field. The 2018 UNESCO's report on the situation in the annexed Crimea notes gross violations by the Russian authorities in protecting cultural heritage in Crimea. According to Ukraine's Ministry of Temporary Occupied Territories, and internally displaced persons. The Russian Federation actively destroys authentic monuments under the guise of so-called conservation works. For example, the Hans Palace in the city of Bakhchisarai, a 13th century monument built with Ottoman and Italian influences that served as the main political, religious, 
and cultural, cultural center of the Crimean Tatar people during the reign of the Crimean Hans is reported to be destructed. In fact, instead of the conservation work, the site was simply repaired by a construction team with no expertise on cultural sites in a matter that arose its authenticity and historical values. Very simple to the case provided in the previous talk by Manana concerning Georgia. Its original old beams, I mean the Hans Palace in Bakhchisarai and handmade roof tiles were replaced. The murals were damaged. This is another example of how the very identity of the Crimean Tatars is being threatened in the occupied territories. The destruction of the misright uh, uh, mis date steers was also recorded. The fall of the columns in the ancient city of Panticapeum, now Kerch, as well as the collapse of part of the vault of the southern gate of Yenikale fortress because of the intensive car traffic over the newly constructed Kerch bridge from Russia. Despite the rules of international law, unsanctioned archaeological excavations were carried out on the peninsula and artifacts were exposed out from its territory to Russia and to the black markets. More than a million artifacts were excavated during the construction of the Kerch bridge connecting the Crimean Peninsula with Russia. Crimean Tatars burial grounds and over 100 historical sites were demolished to construct the Tavrida Highway, which leads to this bridge. Black archaeologists are a major threat to the monuments as well. For example, in December 2018, the Federal Security Service of Russia in Crimea, preventing the illicit circulation of cultural property, seized and handed over to Central Museum of Tauris a collection of 200 artifacts valued at of $2 million. Crimean artifacts and Ukrainian museum collections have been transferred to Russia to be showcased at exhibitions celebrating Russia's own cultural heritage. For example, in 2016, the Tretyakov Gallery in Moscow opened the Evazovsky exhibition, which included about four dozen artworks from the Ivazovsky Museum in the Crimean town of Feodosia. In April 2018, the Golden Horde and Black Sea uh, exhibition opened, uh, opened at the Kazan Kremlin Museum Reserve, featuring a unique exhibit, a stone carved frame of a well dated 13th, 14th century from collection of the Yalta Museum of History and Literature in Crimea. The well-known case of the disputed Crimean Skissian gold artifacts also is a good example. The exhibition, The Crimea Gold and Secrets of the Black Sea, went on view at the Alad Pearson Museum in February 2014, when Crimea was still part of Ukraine. The Dutch Museum was lent 565 pieces from four Crimean museums and 90 pieces from Kiev Museum for the exhibition. The dispute between Ukraine and Russia, where the collection should be returned, has begun after the annexation of the peninsula and still is not completed. In accordance with the current treaty and customary international law and national legislation of Ukraine, all cultural values that have been and continue to be in the temporary occupied territory of the peninsula remain to be Ukrainian. But its cultural property proceedings are challenging due to the lack of access to the occupied territory. Thus, Russia has cultural property obligations due to its status as an occupying power and must take steps to avoid damage to any cultural property and actively work with Ukrainian officially to safeguard Ukrainian heritage. But in reality, the situation is very different. All this prompted Ukraine to approach joining the second protocol of the Hague Convention. And the bill on this was issued 
last April. Uh, let me turn to the next case, to Donbass occupation. The military conflict in Eastern Ukraine since spring 2014 is another vivid case of a major threat to cultural institutions and heritage sites there. Over seven years of severe military conflict resulted in considerable loss of human lives and cultural heritage, intensive refugee and humanitarian crisis. The mostly affected by military actions are historical monuments, museums, cultural centers, and archaeological sites. But states are not only perpetrators of crimes related to the cultural property. There is a growing trend when such offenses are committed by non-state actors, including criminal, armed, and terrorist groups. They touch the object of cultural heritage and attempt to rewrite history, erase whole chapters from the collective memory of people and regions. For example, the Center for Contemporary Art and Platform for Cultural in Initiatives Isolation, Isolatia, housed on the temporary uh, territory of the former insulation material factory in Donetsk, was captured, robbed, and undermined by the pro-Russian separatists. The Donetsk Museum of the World War II was attacked by militants with the aim of appropriation of weapons and military equipment for their further use against the Ukrainian armed forces. The militants of the self-declared states of DNR and LNR hijacked a number of tanks from the historical monuments as well. There is a large number of monuments, ecological sites and, mo and museums which are in the epicenter of military conflict. One of them, Savur Mohila, the World War II Memorial Obelisk collapsed after enduring weeks of heavily shelling. The building of the Luhansk Local Law Museum was also damaged in artillery fire. Currently, Ukraine has no access to the occupied territory and has no information to make a damage assessment. Before the occupation of Eastern regions, the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture uh, visited the endangered museum and sites and advised they are directors and leadership to close exhibitions and to take safety precautions, including enacting emergency planning. The ministry informed the regional state administrations on urgent measures for preservation of cultural property, strengthening protection of cultural prop heritage and worked out recommendations on priority measures for preserving collections and preparing for evacuations. The Donetsk local law museum ignored, unfortunately, their recommendations. And in August 2014, its 30 galleries were damaged by eight shells. And most collections were reported to be lost. It is amazing how practically under fire, local residents helped the museum staff to save valuable items. Local communities quickly self-organized and side by side with museum staff, removed the exhibits to a safer place. Interesting that by saving museum property, the volunteers were healing themselves in that complicated environment, admitting that when working, they stopped listening to explosions and propaganda. What has been done and what kind of response since then? Um, I would like to stress that in 2014, a working group of museum experts was formed on a volunteer base at the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture. Its main function included monitoring the situation in the endangered region, uh, communicating with local authorities and directors of museums and cultural institutions, heritage places, developing instructions, strategies, documents, evacuation plans, recommendations. As a member of this working museum rescue group, I must admit 
that we had not enough knowledge, experience, and resources to provide our mission systematically and skillfully enough. We looked forward to any opportunity in developing our individual and institutional capacities in uniting emergency preparedness and response efforts on local and national levels, in creating a network of experts and volunteers and getting support from our foreign partners. And this great help was provided in particular by international institutions and our colleagues. First aid to cultural heritage training courses mentioned today by my colleagues, the workshops, consultations, discussions, and conferences organized in particular by ICROM, Smithsonian institutions, the Prince Klaus Fund, and supported by many partners in Italy, the Netherlands, USA, Moldova, Ukraine, including US Embassy in Ukraine and the Fulbright program helped us to obtain broader knowledge on various aspects of disaster risk management, to work out strategies and plans to reduce risks of damage to cultural heritage. Uh, this also greatly helped us to implement successful policies and efforts into our practice, to build capacity and strengthen communities to protect our cultural heritage in absolutely different contexts. A number of workshops based on the ICROM's methodologies was held in Ukraine as well. It is important to understand what should be done in the future. As a kind of conclusions, I should state that it happened that international legal regulation of protection and restitution of cultural property have proved to be ineffective in protecting the occupied cultural values in Crimea and areas of armed conflict in Donetsk and Luhansk regions at the concept of internationalized conflict is not enshrined in no in, 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 in present international treaty with international humanitarian law and such qualification will be inclusive doctrinal and will not add any additional means of protection artifacts of the occupied and annexed territories. Thus, in order to be effective in the response to emergency challenges for cultural heritage, to prevent the destruction, trafficking, looting, and smuggling of cultural property during the conflicts, we have to first stress on the responsibility of states for the protection of cultural heritage according to inter international laws their commitments and obligations. Second, create inventories of cultural property and other items of historical, cultural, and religious importance, which have been illegally transferred from armed conflict areas, notab notably uh, from territories under foreign occupation, for ensuring their safe return to the countries of origin in the future. Third, encourage efforts of all jurisdictions national and international, and call for a closer cooperation of law enforcement and custom agencies and in investigations, prosecutions, seizure and confiscation, as well as the return, restitution, or repatriation of traffic cultural property. Uh, Fourth, proactively cooperate in cultural heritage crime cases, liaising with auction houses, and museums to track down objects originating from war affected areas and to prevent the exhibition of the artifacts from occupied territories. Fifth, learn more and exchange international experience in cultural heritage protection and provide systematic consultations with foreign partners and training courses in cultural emergency response. And the last, develop effective teams of cultural heritage experts for rapid actions in complex crises. In conclusion, I would like to stress as well as have already done my colleagues in their speeches today, that this particular moment in time displays a critical need for cultural heritage professionals, institutions and activists 
to gain new skills in empowering and inspiring governmental and local leadership, to exchange knowledge and experience with their international colleagues, to create spaces and opportunities for citizens to be not just spectators, but participants in the ideas and questions that shape and protect art and history and the past and the future. Thank you so much for your attention.